therefore I will talk to you about what I have labeled the colonial coup of uh, Belgian diplomacy during the First World War. I would first like to thank the organizers, uh, Thomas and Gwendal, for allowing me to participate in this exciting conference. Um, so I actually um, started um, doing research uh, on this uh, topic uh, from uh, kind of a historiographical um, for a kind of a question that I had reading historiography about uh, the diplomacy of the Paris Peace Conference. And there I found that historians have often wondered why uh, what they labeled Little Belgium um, behaved the way it did. Uh, several of them were intrigued by uh, the fact that this small state, which before the war had always abided by the policy of strict neutrality on the European scene, which was impo imposed uh, on the country, now adopted a very aggressive and perhaps even irrational attitude. Belgium, as you may know, even demanded territorial expansion at the cost of the Netherlands, a country which had remained neutral during uh, the war. Historians generally attribute this behavior to the diplomatic inexperience of the Belgian foreign minister, the liberal politician uh, Paul Hemans. I believe that this argument places too much emphasis on the share of politicians in the making of foreign policy and underestimates the impacts of diplomats. In the decades before the First World War, Belgian politicians had generally shown very little interest in the foreign ministry. Foreign policy making had remained the realm of the king and of the country's senior diplomats. During the war, however, an upcoming and impatient generation of junior diplomats ousted their senior colleagues from the foreign ministry, managed to sideline the king, King Albert I, and took over the reign of Belgian foreign policy. Away with neutrality was their motto. Away with a neutralist policy advocated um, by Belgian senior diplomats and by uh, the king. These diplomats were schooled in the colonial ventures of the old king, of late king Leopold uh, II, and in the expansionist idea of a greater Belgium that came along with it. Once they um, obtained the key postings at the, at the foreign ministry, they lured the diplomatically inexperienced politicians towards an annexationist agenda. This agenda, as I will argue uh, today, came about as a, as a result of the transformation of these junior diplomats' imperialist mindset under the influence of perceived opportunities for territorial expansion within Europe. So I will try to make these points of a foreign policy inspired by colonial or imperialist mindsets of Belgian junior diplomats by trying to answer uh, four questions. So first, who were these diplomats? Then second, what was this colonial mindset? Third, how did the advent of the First World War uh, affect this imperial mind? And then lastly, how did junior diplomats manage to gain control of Belgian foreign policy? So first, who were they? Well, the two most important among them were Pierre Orts and Albert de Basson-Pierre, the men who in the summer of 1917 became respectively Secretary General and Political Director of the Foreign Ministry and from then on occupied the key positions in Belgian diplomacy. Both Orts and Basson-Pierre were born in families of the Brussels high bourgeoisie and both of them started their professional careers in 1898 and also both of them would spend the following two decades now attached to the foreign ministry and then um, to the colonial administration. By the time the First World War broke out, Basson Pierre was second in command at the political direction of the foreign ministry, while Orts had attained the highest uh, junior diplomatic rank of advisor, but actually acted as an advisor to the colonial minister. This is to say that these men were well versed in colonial affairs and most likely ever since the start of their careers, prone to embrace colonial or imperialist uh, ideas. This brings me to my second question. What was this colonial mindset and to what extent was it present among Belgian diplomats? So Pierre Orts, in his uh, memoirs, um, in his unpublished memoirs, he reminisced about the early years, uh, his early years in the diplomatic corps, and, and he writes, and I give you the English translation, with a few uh, young functionaries, we formed the generation of the Congo, the one that claimed that their horizons and preoccupations had been enlarged by the contact with the African oeuvre of Leopold II. We felt very strongly that to preserve our recently acquired colonial domain, it was necessary to accept certain risks. The pusillanimity of our elders irritated and worried us. 
It is from that epoch, that's around 1905, that my aversion for the regime of neutrality stems. So what clearly emerges from Orts' recollections is a sharp distinction between two foreign policy ideologies, imperialism attributed to Belgium's junior diplomats, on the one hand, and neutrality associated with the country's senior diplomats, on the other hand. As you probably all know, in the mid-1880s, King Leopold II acquired the Congo Free State as a personal dominion and managed, despite gross crimes against humanity, to hold on to it until 1908, when ownership of the colony was transferred to the Belgian state. Yet already from the early, 19, early 1890s onwards, Leopold II's aggressive colonial policy alienated many of the diplomats who had been crucial in acquiring the colony in the 1880s. And these diplomats in the years before the war still occupied Belgium's key, uh, the Belgian diplomacy's key positions. These were men who pleaded for the precedence of neutrality over empire because they felt that Leopold II's policy had increasingly endangered Belgium's security within Europe. But Orts, as the quotation shows, despised such a policy of self-effacement. And he was not alone in this. To give just one other example of the extent to which a colonial mindset was present in the Belgian diplomatic corps, I would like to focus briefly on a speech given in 1913 by a diplomat called uh, Prince Pierre de caraman chimin The lecture entitled Patriotisme et Patrie um, was organized by the Société Belge d'Études Coloniales, uh, one of the country's colonial lobby groups. So Caraman makes an interesting opposition between, on the one hand, Belgium's political achievements, which he fully equates with colonial policy and all subsumes under the heading expansion, and on the other hand, the policy of neutrality. He argued that the acquisition of the Congo by the genius uh, Leopold II changed the very physiognomy of our people and vivified the air we breathe. Yet he proceeded, after having affirmed our virility in front of the whole world, we keep our eyes stubbornly fixated upon pieces of paper and treaties. Have some of us not thoughtlessly let themselves be hypnotized by this all too often repeated word, neutrality? Caraman claimed that he would easily succeed in proving them wrong, were it not that his, that his position as a diplomat refrained him from doing so. He concluded this part of his lecture by expressing his conviction that talking like this will not discredit me as hostile towards the world, world of diplomacy, which I have served with passion and to which I have the honor of belonging. However, more implicitly than Orts did in his memoirs, Caramon too pointed to antagonistic ideas within the Belgian diplomatic corps about the primacy of either imperialism or neutrality in the making of the country's foreign policy. And Caramon too reluctantly recognized that the neutralist narrative was still hegemonic. So in answer to our third question, that is, how did uh, the advent of the First World War and the violation of Belgian neutrality by the, Belgian arm, by, by the German army affect this imperial mindset? In order to answer that question, we'd have to evaluate this idea of a conflict of the generations within Belgian diplomacy. The American historian Jonathan Helmreich has put forth the view that the predecessors of the Congo generation had formed the generation themselves, distinct from the first group of Belgian diplomats. He suggested in the 15 years before the Franco-Prussian War of 1870, the old revolutionaries, as he calls them, had been replaced by men of a new generation. It's important to underline that after the Belgian Revolution of 1830, the first generation of diplomats had greatly contributed to the Belgian occupation of parts of the Dutch territories of Limburg, Zeeland and Luxembourg, with a view of incorporating these lands into the Belgian states. After the 1839 Treaty of London, these provinces were ultimately lost in the words of uh, these revolutionaries, and many of them had great difficulties accepting that. Explaining why Belgian diplomats did all they could to avoid getting involved in the, Bel the Franco-Prussian conflict in 1870, so more than 20 years later, while it could have gained them, them Luxembourg, one of the lost provinces, Helmreich argues that there was now a new generation of diplomats which was more imbued with the self-effacing diplomacy required by the country's neutrality. Now, the first generation of revolutionaries had a lot of in common with the third generation of the Congo. Contrary to the second generation of neutrality, they favored a proactive stance in international relations. 
the generation of revolutionaries strained themselves, had strained themselves in the 1830s to obtain legitimate and full possession of Luxembourg, uh, Dutch Limburg, and Flemish uh, Zealand. Uh, while the generation of the Congo had followed the lead of Leopold II and found the greater Belgium beyond Europe. Yet they had not forgotten about the struggle that their grandfathers had lost in 1839. Many of the discourses of the Congo generation diplomats are punctuated with connections between the idea of a greater Belgium within and outside of Europe, between colonialism and what in the First World War would be labeled annexationism. Taking the example of Prince Pierre de Caramanchimet, he argued in his lecture that the feat of Belgian expansionism was all the greater because it showed how the country had grown, quote, despite possessing only an intermediary portion of the Skeld and Meuse basins, Skeld that is Esco, which nourish our territory. The Skeld and the Meuse are the rivers that cross the Belgian border into uh, Zealand. So the Skeld is here and the Meuse is here. They cross the Belgian border into uh, Zealand, Flanders, and Dutch Limburg, uh, respectively. When the First World War broke out in August 1914, the Congo generation diplomats soon became convinced that the time was now ripe to work, to, to work towards the realization of a greater Belgium, now not in the first place overseas, but within Europe. From the organic imagery in discourses such as that of Karaman, you can imagine how important they deem this physical growth of their country now that neutrality had been violated, they felt that nothing should stop them from throwing away the treaties that had imposed it onto Belgium and to pursue a more aggressive annexationist policy. So less than a week after the German army's invasion, one junior diplomat quite remarkably noted, quote, we are working like crazy here, but what a joy to witness the birth of a greater Belgium. While another diplomat was convinced that the war would soon lead to, quote, a treaty consecrating a new enlarged Belgium. However, from inside the foreign ministry, Pierre Hortz and Albert de Bassompierre realized that they would first have to take the control of, over Belgian foreign policy away from the neutralists. I will not go into detail, but I will try to briefly explain the different stages of Hortz's and Bassompierre's coup of Belgian foreign policy. Stage one was gaining the, thru the trust of Belgium's leading politicians, the ministers, and instilling them with the Congo generation's ideas. Not all of them were easily swayed, but by early 1915, several important ministers were won over for the annexationist cause. Especially Jules Rancain, uh, whom you see in the picture, the colonial minister, uh, became the staunchest supporter of a larger, uh, larger Belgium uh, within the Council of Ministers. This was primarily the work of Orts, who had actually already been uh, Rancain's diplomatic advisor for many years and had a close relationship uh, with him. Rankin's office also served as the meeting place of these annexationist uh, diplomats. In his diaries, Bassompierre describes how he and his friends were fulminating against negotiations with the Dutch for some kind of co-sovereignty over the Skeld. This was a compromise idea devised by the foreign minister, Baron Beyens, who was a neutralist. So if Belgium would, would obtain co-sovereignty over the Skeld without annexation, Bassompierre argued, Zealand Flanders would become an organ that has lost its function, like the appendix. And it has to be removed when it becomes a cause of irritation, or even before. Seemingly pleased with his own ingenuity in matters of organic metaphorical expressions, Bassompierre then exclaimed that Zealand Flanders is Holland's appendicitis. Another junior functionary immediately added that Limburg is her hernia, and as true friends we should give her the double operation. For these ideas to materialize, the foreign minister, Baron Beyens, would have to be removed from power. This was stage two of the coup. Beyens, um, before I forget to mention this, was actually a senior diplomat, uh, quite exceptionally made for a minister in 1915 uh, by the king. And he was one who believed that Belgian diplomacy should stick to the pre-war policy of neutrality and pursue restoration of the country's pre-war borders, and by no means, and he was very explicit about this, annexation of Dutch territories. Passompierre's diaries and Orts' memoirs are filled with accounts of the nocturnal scheming of these young functionaries and of the strategies they devised to influence members of the government to have the foreign minister to have, to have Bayens uh, removed. By the summer of 1917, they would obtain the results that they hoped for. Bayens had to go and was replaced in the first instance by um, 
Charles de Brockville, and in the second instance by uh, Paul Hammans. Um, I will uh, not say anything about Brockville, but I can answer questions about that later, and immediately uh, skip to uh, Hammans. Hammans was one who would actually loyally execute the policy formulated by Orts and Bassompierre, and would only start to distance himself from them in late 1919, that is, several months after the Paris Peace Conference had ended. Discussions about Belgian-Dutch relations had by then been referred to a special commission with the explicit clause that territorial claims would not be honored. By the time these negotiations threatened to come to nothing, and they threatened to come to nothing because of continued references by Orts and Bassompierre to uh, some kind of acquisition of Dutch Limburg and Zeeland, so by that, that time the distance between Hermans on the one hand and Orts and Bassompierre on the other hand was finally widening. There's a passage in Bastien Pierre's diaries from this period which very well illustrates, I think, how Belgian foreign policy in these days was made. So this is a passage in English because Bastien Pierre actually uh, alter alternatively writes in English, or in some kind of English and in French uh, in these diaries. So what Bastien Pierre said uh, was, uh, I said calmly that the government would have, in case of rupture, to examine what measures of precaution must be taken. We cannot risk to be faced once more with the situation of August 1831, when the Dutch took us unprepared. Mr. Hammonds declared he would never make a policy leading to war, that war was out of the question. I replied that it might be forced upon us. When all had gone, except Hyman's Orts and I, I insisted to Mr. Hammonds that what he had said was dangerous, because if it was known publicly that Belgium would shun war in any case, the Dutch would become all the more determined to give us nothing and to bluff us by war menaces. He got angry and spoke of la politique qu'on lui fait faire, etc. I maintain my point of view to the evident delight of Orts. So, compared to official diplomatic documents whose authorship is not always clear and published memoirs of leading politicians whose narrative often overestimates the heroism of the protagonists, Ego documents like the unpublished memoirs and diaries of Orts and Bassompierre shed a different light on how Belgian foreign policy was made. They portray politicians as the mere executors of an ideology and a strategy formulated by diplomats. They lead us to believe that Belgian failure in Versailles was not about diplomatically inexperienced politicians, but it was actually caused by an absence of a consensus on foreign policy objectives within the Belgian diplomatic corps. This absence weakened the cohesion of the corps and thus the efficacy of Belgian diplomacy. And this is important as those with the most experience in European diplomacy and those who held the most realist foreign policy objectives were actually removed from the scene. But in this paper, I've also tried to show that Belgian foreign policy making before, during and immediately after the First World War was about the historical struggle uh, for hegemony between the competing uh, narratives of expansion and neutrality. I've used the idea of three generations of Belgian diplomats, although I'm not sure that this is actually the most accurate uh, description because, of course, there were always individual diplomats who held ideas that had been dominant but weren't anymore or who advocated ideas that still had to break through. And to make just one final uh, connection with uh, the panel session about neutrality, I think uh, neutrality had a profound influence on Belgian diplomatic uh, culture, but I've also tried to show that it was never fully interiorized by the diplomatic corps, and that this was actually a consequence of the global, global dimension or the global mental dimension, at least, of uh, Belgian foreign policy. Thank you. <laughs>